Hi everyone, it's Mr. Sinti, and today I'd like to talk to you about uh, gene pools a little bit more. And I'm going to connect our idea of a gene pool, like for example, in these little piggies right here. Uh, we're going to consider what the allele frequencies are for the homozygous recessive, the homozygous dominant, and the heterozygous. And then the heart of what we want to talk about today is that there was a German physician and a British mathematician named Hardy and Weinberg. And they were thinking that in a gene pool, if you keep certain conditions together and you just have the pigs mate with one another, once you determine the allele frequency, that allele frequency should theoretically maintain itself after generation after generation of random mating. And so in other words, they said that there would be sort of like this continuity, this sort of genetic equilibrium that should never change. And if a population allele frequency were to change, then there you would have it. You would, you would be able to see evolution occurring. And so that, that's what this conversation is all about. And so let's jump into this conversation and see what comes of it. So as you can see here, do you see these pigs right here? If I were to count them, this is my little population of pigs. So this is going to be my gene pool. And then I can see, can you see how some of them are pink and some of them are black or gray? Let me just say that um, the pink is going to be the dominant allele. So I'm going to say that the P for uh, pink. Let me do that. P for pink. And let's say that the Q, which is the recessive allele, is uh, black. Let me go that way, black, like this. Now, what's interesting about it, I don't know exactly. I know the black ones. Like, if I were to do the black, I would know that they're Q, Q, like this, Q, 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 because they're showing a phenotype that's, that's recessive. So I know that the black pigs are, if you, if you were, Q squared. But I don't know what the pinks are. I don't know if the pink is homozygous pink or is heterozygous pink. But there's a way to know that. And let me show you how to do it. So the black is what we know. So I'm going to be like, okay, one, two, three, four. There's four black ones. So remember that the pigs that are black are Q squared. And I'm going to say in my gene pool, there's four of 16 that are black. And so when I do the math on that, I'm going to say that Q squared is 25%. Do you see that? And so if I want just Q, if I want just the Q allele in my gene pool, I'm going to take the square root to get rid of the, the exponent on both sides. And so my Q, square root of 0.25 uh, is actually 0.5. So if Q is 0.5, I know in my gene pool, I'll always remember that P plus Q is equal to 1. So if I know that Q is 0.5, then I, know, I must know that P is 0.5. That is what I know. Q is 0.5 and P is 0.5. So if that's the case, let me, let me reconstruct this. Let me say that if P is 0.5 and Q is 0.5, here's my question. Well, I know my gene pool is going to have some homozygous dominant pink ones. And I know that some of these pinkies out here are going to be heterozygous. Do you remember heterozygous is 2PQ? And then some of the ones that are black are Q squared. And that has to equal to 1. That's 100%. So remember, P plus Q is also equal to 1. So what do I know? I know that my Q squared, because I just got through doing that, I know that my Q squared is um, point to five. So I'm going to put that right there. And so if Q is 0.5 and P is 0.5, then I know that 0.5 times 0.5 is 0.25. You see how that works? And so 25% plus 25%. Now if I do the math on this, 0.5 times 0.5 times 0.2 is in fact what is it? It is, let's see, let me use my calculator here. 
I'll, I'll just pretend like I don't know. So 0. 0.5 times 0. 0.5 equals 0. 0.25 times 2, hmm, it equals to 0.5. So I'm going to put that there. And that makes perfectly good sense. So 25, 50, and 25 will equal 100. And so here is my equation in my gene pool. So if that isn't making complete sense, um, I have another example <laughs> that we can look at. So this is dominant homozygous dominant plus heterozygous plus homozygous recessive equals to one. So let me introduce you to Hardy and Weinberg. These, these gentlemen right here came up with this theorem that described a non-evolving population. Because what, I, what we mean by that is if there's a population like this and let's say that the Q is 0.7 and the P would therefore be 0.3. So what they said is, if you had the allele frequency, if you're able to calculate that, then the population should never change. It's sort of like in physics, um, an object in motion should never not be in motion. Like you put, you, you put a force onto an object and it'll move in that direction. And But you know this, when you throw a baseball and you put a force on it, it's going to fall to the earth. And that's because there's gravity pushing it down, which means that if a population were to change, there must be some force acting upon it. And maybe that force could possibly be natural selection, but there's some other forces at play as well. So they described a non-evolving population. And so let's get into that. So Hardy-Weinberg theorem describes a gene pool that's not changing. And so this is what our, our podcast is all about today. Let me start off with uh, a rather wordy example. I apologize for all of this, but let me sort of walk you through it. One of the things that, that is um, cumbersome to, to humans is that we have these genetic disorders that can come up. And the, one of them is called PKU. And it's, um, it's something that can easily be detected in a newborn and with a little pin prick, print, print prick of the blood. And so one of the things about it is that it's fairly rare and we know this because hospitals report this, that one in every 10,000 babies are born in the United States with PKU. And there's some problems with it. It can result in really sad mental retard retardation if it's left unchecked. And so these are individuals that are homozygous recessive. It's a recessive allele, as it turns out. And you know the background story on this, it's not really genetics, but it's more like physiology. It's the fact that the enzyme necessary, the problem is, there's an enzyme that takes the amino acid phenylalanine and it sort of converts it to a threosine. And if the if enzyme's not present, phenylalanine accumulates and then it gets converted into something called uh, phenylpyruvate and then into a phenylketone and then it causes problems with, uh, with the brain. And you can detect this in the urine or in the blood. And so the the treatment to this is try to have a diet that doesn't have a lot of phenylalanine on it. And so there's products that, are, that have warning labels for this. And so this is what I want you to know from this. Uh, do you see one in every 10,000 babies have this? So that means that Q squared is one in every 10,000. Okay, that's what we need to know. Why do we need to know this? Because, say, here's the question. I would like to know, what's the percentage of Americans, this is the United States, what's the percentage of Mer Americans that are carriers for PKU? You know, like carriers, that means heterozygous. So I would like to know 2PQ. I would like to know what's the percentage of Americans that are carriers for PKU disease. Now, how are we going to f find that out? Well, we need to find out Q. If we know Q, then we'll know P. And if we know P and Q, then we'll be able to, to dominate. And so check it out. Um, Q squared, in other words, that was the, the one baby in 10,000 is Q squared. So that's 0 0.0001. And so in order to find out, that's Q squared. In order to find out Q, you would take the square root 
of 0 0.0001, and that is 0 0.01. So Q, I'm going to just write on top of this. So Q, even though it says it right here, Q is 0 0.01. That's 1%. So if Q is 1%, P is 99%. Do you follow that? Or 0.99. So once you know Q is this and P is this, then in, to determine the heterozygous, the heterozygous is 2PQ or a carrier. So who's a carrier? So what you would do is take the Q, 0 0.01, and the P, which is 0 0.99, multiply them together and then times it by 2, and you get this. And then when you round it up, it's about 2% of... America is a carrier for this disease. And you're like, well, why is that important? Well, if someone's a carrier, PQ, marries another person who's a carrier, PQ, what are the chances of their child having PKU? And that, that's even 25%. Because over here they wouldn't have it, and over here they wouldn't have it and wouldn't have it. So that's how you could use the Hardy-Weinberg equation to determine carriers in a, in, a, in a population or heterozygous. So 2% of the United States is a carrier. So what I wanted to say about this, as I was saying before, is Hardy and Weinberg theorem says that if you can determine, like we did in these pigs, if you can determine the allele frequency, so in, in the pig population, do you remember P was 0.5 and Q was 0.5? What Hardy and Weinberg are saying is that if the population allele frequency is known, it should remain constant over generation and generation unless acted upon. So in other words, they're saying that populations should not evolve. Because the next generation, so if all these pigs just reproduce and have children, have children, have children, and you, and you do the same thing, you determine the allele frequency, it should be 0.5 and 0.5. So if it does change, it's the result of some, some force acting upon it because just mere meiosis and fertilization and random mating is not going to do it. And so let's consider this. So do you, if you recall from a previous vi video, we were looking at flower color. We were looking at red and white flower color. So Hardy and Weinberg would say that whatever the allele frequency is, and if you remember, it was 80% R and 20% little r, they would say that it should remain like that forever and ever and ever. And that's what they called genetic equilibrium. So that's our term today. Hardy-Weinberg theorem is another way of saying genetic equilibrium, which means that once you determine the allele frequency of a population, and you can determine it like we've just been doing, you find Q and once you have Q, you can then determine P, and then you have it all. Once the allele frequency has been determined, it should always remain that, generation after generation. That's what they say. It would be in genetic equilibrium. It'll never change. But indeed, populations do change. So therefore, they do evolve. So what are the forces that can cause evolution is our question. So... Microevolution is the fact that from generation to generation, allele frequencies do change. So if you want to know if something's changed, you've got to know what it is at the start. So in other words, say your GPA is 3.5, and then you know it's changed. Well, I, it's 3.7 now. Well, in order to, to establish a change, you needed to know that there was a difference. It was 3.5 and then it went up to 3.7 or if it was 3.5 and it went down to 3.0. So Hardy-Weinberg sort of provides a baseline. Once you know what the allele frequencies are, then you can compare them to the frequencies in the next generation and next generation. And if it's changing, it's evolving. And so we define the allele frequency changes in a gene pool over time as microevolution. And so there's a few factors that can cause microevolution. And what are these factors that cause microevolution? These are the five criteria that can change the allele frequency in a population. Now, these are all very important. And so the only one that we've discussed at length so far is natural selection. We've, we've said that in a gene pool, if there are certain phenotypes 
that are better in a particular environment, then those organisms will survive and they'll have a reproductive success and there'll be more of those phenotypes in the next generation. So obviously that's a, a change. And natural selection uh, adapts and changes those gene pools for a positive direction. But there's something else that can be working on it. Genetic drift, gene flow, mutation, and non-random mating. There's five forces that can act on a gene pool. And let's consider them. They're all totally interesting and all really important. But only natural selection changes a gene pool in a positive direction. These could change a gene pool in a negative direction, a neutral direction, or a positive direction. But they're all random except for natural selection. So all of these things uh, are departures from the genetic equilibrium of Hardy-Weinberg. And so let's take a look here at our, our gene pool of mice. Do you see how you can look at the total allele frequency? Now it's easier when, when you can see that if something's homozygous or heterozygous, but we would have been able to figure this out on its own. But let's say, for example, the white mouse is, for some reason, more camouflage in this new environment. The mice are going, like, do you remember? There's light-colored mice and dark-colored mice, or I could say dark is better, it depends. Like, do you remember in New Mexico, in the volcano about, an, about a thousand years ago, in the ring of fire, and, it, and the lava uh, created like this dark rock, and the mice, do you remember the rock pocket mice? Let's just, let's go with that, and say that the black was certainly a better color, especially when there's those, those killer owls circul circulating above, picking them off. And so if the white ones are going to be eaten, watch this, if the white ones are going to be eaten like this, these dark ones are going to be the ones that are surviving and reproducing. And so the dark allele is going to increase. And the, so in other words, the dark allele, let's say that's P, is going to increase. And the Q allele is going to decrease in the future generations. And so natural selection is a factor that causes microevolution. And so it, the selection favors disproportionately a proportion of the population that has a, a favorable trait. And so it leads to an adaptation. Natural selection does. And so other factors that can influence uh, populations, uh, in addition to Hardy and Weinberg, are not necessarily all positive. Natural selection is definitely positive. But another way in which populations can change is if a population size becomes very, very small. And so what's interesting about that is for genetic equilibrium to, to maintain itself, population size must be very large for it to occur. And so if a population size is reduced, there's two ways in which population sizes can be reduced. But let me just talk about why the population size has to be large in order to maintain genetic equilibrium. Let me give you a simple example. Like, for example, everyone knows, like, uh, when you uh, toss a coin, you could have either heads or tails, and it's approximately 50-50. Now, if you were to uh, flip a coin, and you would only flip it, like, say, 10 times, um, would you really be surprised if, for example, you got seven heads and three tails. Like, this could happen. Like, I know it's supposed to be five and five, but you've only flipped it ten times. And so chance played more of a role in that. Like, if you were to, and, and so therefore, if you were to do it again, you might get 60-40. And if you do it again, it would be 50-50. And if you did it again, it might be 80-20. And you're like, man, the... It's changing every time I do it. Well, the reason that it's changing is because you're only flipping it 10 times. So chance is playing a role. And so if you were to flip it, let's just say a thousand times, that would be very, very unusual if you'd get 700 heads and, and 30, 300 tails. So if you did it a thousand times, you'd expect it more to be 50 50. And so what, what, where am I going with this? Well, a, a massive reduction in population size causes something known as genetic drift.
the allele frequencies will drift, not due to selection, but to, they will drift due to the lowering of the population size. Now let's give some biology examples of this. So the smaller the sample, the greater the chance of deviation. Do you remember like in our, our coin toss, if you only do it 10 times, you can get 80, 20, 60, 40, 50, 50. So, there is, so you can think of drift as small sample size or small population size. And there's two things in biology that can cause a, a reduction in population size. Now, I'm not talking about natural selection. So what could reduce a population size? One of them is bottleneck, and the other one is founder effect. These are the two examples of genetic drift. And so what is it? So applied to population genetics, we can expect that a gene pool is going to stay the same if it's in genetic equilibrium. We can expect it to be the same. But if the population is very small, then maybe there's going to be some erratic changes that occur. Okay, so let's give a biological definition uh, example of this. Like, say we're, we're looking at this gene pool right here, and we're like, okay, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten plants that are going to be producing pollen and reproducing. But you know, the truth is, ten is not a very large gene pool. And so, as it turns out, do you see here? If we looked, it's much easier when the genotypes are written here in the gene pool. So check this out: big R or P is 70% and Q is 30%. So this is the start of it. So this is a population, and Hardy and Weinberg would say, guess what? That allele frequency is going to stay the same forever. Every generation it's going to be 70-30, 70-30, 70-30. But as it turns out that when the wind blows or a bee helps to pollinate, only these are the ones that are reproducing. So a small number, only five of the plants are leaving offspring. So check it out. In the next generation, look at this. This is what you get. In the next generation, the allele frequency changed. And so it evolved. Do you see that, how it's 0.5 and 0.5? So the fact that the allele frequencies change means that the populations are evolving. They went from 70, 30 down to 50, 50. So that's an evolutionary event. But that's not necessarily natural selection. That's just the that's just showing that the population sizes are very small. And then watch this. In the next generation, so in the third generation, let's just say that only two of the plants were to reproduce. And if, the two, if these two plants are the ones that are reproducing, do you notice here? Let's look at the genotypes. Do you see how that's homozygous dominant and that's homozygous dominant? What happens if two homozygous dominants reproduce with one another? That means all the offspring are going to be homozygous dominant. So what are the allele frequencies in the third generation? They're going to be 1 and 0, so 100% and 0. So what's interesting is these populations will never be able to uh, change from then on. Now it's fixed. And so this is something that can happen not because of selection, but because the population size has been reduced due to the small number. So this is an example of genetic drift when the population gets really small. So a, an example of how genetic drift occurs is this. Take a look at this. Say that this is a, a, some population. It could represent anything. It could be butterflies. It could be birds. It could be trees. It could be cheetah. It could be whales. It could be elephant seals. I can keep going with that. This represents any population. And do you see how the little colored beads are in here? This represents different alleles that are present. And so there's a lot of genetic diversity in gene pools. And, and here's the question. Where do you get all these colored beads? It's sort of like a gumball machine at the grocery store. How do you get all these colors? It's mutations that generate new alleles in the gene pool. But then check this out. If only a few individuals are allowed to go through the thin bottleneck right here and come out, and you're like, well, why aren't all of them able to reproduce or how come only a few of them are surviving? Maybe something happened. Maybe, as it turns out, there was a fire that came and burned down all of these plants, and only these were the survivors. Or um, logging occurred, 
and it eliminated all of these trees except for these ones right here. Or if this is an animal, say hunters came into the area and just started eliminating, or whalers came and started killing all these whales, and you reduced the population size to just a few. Now as it turns out, do you notice how all that genetic variation has been eliminated? Well, only these are the ones that are able to reproduce, and so you can get the numbers to come back up again. I mean, you can get, I'm not talking about population size, but do you notice here the variation has changed? So this population has evolved. And so, like for example, the panda bear in China, you, you can eliminate so many of these panda bears, and then in the zoo you can, you can try to reproduce them and grow them back, but you've lost that. So this is an example of genetic drift caused by bottlenecking. When the population size gets really low, and it's not selection. Like, for example, a, a great example of this in conservation biology is endangered species. You can take a population and reduce their numbers down to, you know, crisis. Like, the number of cheetahs in the wild is, is scarily low. And you're like, well, well, we'll make up a law and we'll forbid people from killing them. It's not going to necessarily um, help as much because you've bottlenecked all of that frequency of, of alleles, so the population has been evolving. And so when it comes back through that bottleneck, there's not gonna, they're not going to exhibit a lot of genetic variation. And when populations don't have a lot of genetic variation, they're more vulnerable to diseases and things that can come in and get them all sick because they're not very diverse. And so it's kind of like this. If this is the cheetahs, I know these are ladybugs, but and there's only two different colors, but picture so many different kinds of cheetahs. So, I mean, it's taken hundreds of thousands of years to create through mutation all those wonderful traits that cheetahs had. And because we've hunted them and hunted them down, there's just a few left, and maybe they're very similar. But even if we breed them back up, we've lost that genetic diversity. So the point is, the population has evolved, but it hasn't evolved for the better. The allele frequencies have changed, but I, I would argue that they're not necessarily for the best. And the reason that there is been a change is that the population drifted because the numbers were so low, and so chance allowed just these individuals to survive, and thus there's been an evolutionary event, so genetic drift. Another example close to home is that after a lot of the whales were, were murdered, um, a couple of hundred years ago for their blubber, uh, humans started picking on these elephant seals, the northern elephant seal, and we, which are found uh, off, off the coast of, of Santa Cruz. I don't know if you've ever had a chance to visit them in a place called Costa Noa um, in Anya Nueva down in, in Santa Cruz. The population size has been eliminated. They, they believe that it had been reduced to about just a handful, like 20 or so. And so over, over the years, there's now been a ban on it. So they've rebounded to a couple of, um, couple of thousand, 30,000 of them. So they're building back up, but they're all very, very similar to one another because they've gone through this bottleneck. So the population has been reduced uh, uh, genetically. The second way in which drift can occur is when populations become very small when they go off to colonize a new area. Like this is called founder effect. And so if you have a population and just a few individuals were to leave it and start a new population somewhere else, like for example, like on the Galapagos Islands, not, you're not going to take every representative bird that lives in Ecuador and go to the Galapagos Islands. When just a few individuals leave, you're talking about a drift event occurring because um, the founder effect, you know, founder effect means like, like for example, if organisms are going from this area and they're traveling over here and they're going to a new land and they're like, yes, I'm founding this new land. What's happening is a small number is going over. And when a small number goes over, uh, just chance um, variation will cause an evolutionary event to occur. Let's look at some examples of this. So. There's a couple of e examples of human uh, that, have, uh, that have shown um, 
founder effect. Like, for example, there's in South Africa, um, South Africa was, um, was settled by uh, Dutch settlers. And as it turns out that in the small group that went into South Africa, as it turns out that um, a few of the colonists had this disease called Hunting, Huntington's disease. And as a result of just a few individuals having it, these individuals were able to like reproduce with one another. And so the numbers really, really increased. And so when you compare this population to other populations, there's a major change that occurs. And that's because a few individuals, and they happen to have this particular disease, and it, and it, uh, and it increased in numbers. Another example of Huntington's disease is in the, the country of Venezuela. And this is a, a scientist by the name of, uh, of, of Nancy, uh, what is her name? I'm sorry, I'm not seeing her name on here. Na I'm sorry, up here, Nancy Wexler. And she was um, a real pioneer and a really great biologist because she had Huntington's disease in her family. And she was really curious about what happened in Venezuela. There's a region in Venezuela that has a high incidence of Huntington's disease, and she was here. She is working on a pedigree, trying to figure out what's going on with this. And as it turns out, that just when you look at this area, that it was, uh, it's an example of founder effect. Just a few individuals that came into this area happened to have Huntington's disease, and therefore, just by simply a fluke, uh, then, as it turns out the population is interbreeding with one another and so there's a high allele frequency and so that's an example of an evolution a micro evolution caused by genetic drift which it's not a good thing that there's so many people with Huntington's disease but it's a result of genetic drift and founder effect and so another violation so genetic drift can cause micro evolution so genetic drift Genetic drift is a violation of Hardy-Weinberg's genetic equilibrium. In other words, genetic equilibrium is the, the allele frequencies should never change, but they are changing due to bottlenecking and founder effect. Now, another change that can occur is migration. So, in other words, organisms can enter a population, and if, if new organisms enter a population, that obviously is going to change things. Like, for example, in a high school environment, when new freshmen come in, that's going to change the allele frequency. So that's immigration. And then the seniors graduate, that's emigration. So when members come and go from a population, that's going to affect the allele frequency. And you're like, well, that's obvious. Well, if that occurs, that's called gene flow. If that occurs, then evolution will occur. The, the high school allele frequencies will change. So that's an example of evolution. It's not all caused by natural selection. And so the reason I show this map here of some redwood parks up in north in, in California here is that what's kind of sad about this is that humans have been cutting and cutting and cutting down the redwood forests of northern California. We've already cut 95% down. So that's an example of genetic drift. So that's bottlenecking. We've, we've destroyed. So in addition to that, though, is these populations of redwoods are like, now they're preserved and saved, so to speak. But now they're in these little, they're like little islands, and they're separated pretty far apart from one another. They're not really islands. They're in lands. But I say islands because they're separated by non-redwood, which means that it's difficult to have uh, gene flow between these populations. In other words, they're not able to pollinate with one another because they're so far apart. And so that in it itself, well, if you had gene flow, that would increase variation. And so there's no, mig no migration between these populations. Now, Mutation, if this is the third criteria for Hardy-Weinberg, there's five of them. If you have a mutation, that's going to create new alleles. So new alleles are formed through mutation. So Hardy-Weinberg said, well, if, if a population never changes in genetic equilibrium, you can never have mutation. So that, that's odd.
So if you're looking at the allele frequencies and they change, it might be due to, to simply a mutation. So in order to have genetic equilibrium, you can have no mutation, no drift, no gene flow. <laughs> and mating must be random. In other words, individuals in the gene pool, it's like a deck of cards or beads in a, in a, in a, a big dish. If the deck of cards, if you have 70% red cards and 30% black cards, and you sort of shuffle them up, what is the chances of pulling a red one out? It's 30. What are the chances of pulling a black one out? It's, it's 70. But when the individuals are mating with one another, if individuals are not mating randomly, in other words, individuals are choosing certain individuals based on certain phenotypes and their planned favorites, then obviously the allele frequencies would change from generation to generation. So mating must be random. Mating must be random. And so this is certainly something that's, that's curious because organisms, I'm not sure, mate randomly. I think there are some criteria that, that organisms are looking for in a mate. But, but mating must be random in order to maintain Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. And then lastly, there can be no natural selection because natural selection is going to favor certain phenotypes over others. They're going to reproduce. And so those alleles are going to increase in the gene pool and you're going to get evolution. But natural selection is the only force that is going to cause a population to evolve positively. Drift might be negative. Uh, gene flow might be negative. Like you could possibly like lose your great students and get crummy students in. Or you could lose your crummy seniors and get excellent freshmen. So it's random. And natural selection results in positive. So ev evolution will result if any of the five conditions are not met. So any of those things can cause evolution to occur. In other words, uh, simply cutting down lots of redwood trees has resulted in the evolution of the redwood trees. And I would certainly argue that it's not for the best. But the allele frequencies have changed. It is not natural selection for trees to be cut down by murderous humans. And so selection is a is natural selection is, is a positive thing. It's clearly a violation of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, and it will result in alleles that are passed on to the next generation just proportionately that are positive alleles. And like so finally, in this wildflower gener uh, example that I was going over, um, say that there is, a, there is an insect that was more likely to eat white flowers. So it can see these white flowers, and so the insect comes over here, and it's like chomp, chomp, chomp. It's eating the white flower, eating the white flower. There's red ones in the pool, too. But if it's picking on the white ones, this is selection. It's picking on the white ones because it can see them, so that's a disadvantage. So over time, the, the little white allele will do what? The little R allele should be going in a downward direction, and the big R should be going in an upward direction. And I know what you might be thinking, that, geez, if, if this bug kills all the white ones, there'll be no little r ever. No, no, it, the little r can remain in the heterozygous. And you're like, well, who cares about that? Who cares if it remains in the heterozygous? You want it to remain in the heterozygous for this reason, that, for example, if, if a plant that's heterozygous mates with another plant that's heterozygous, you can get the white to appear again. And it's like, who knows, maybe that bug gets eliminated or in the future something else happens. And so you want to sometimes have an allele that remains hidden in the heterozygous just in case the environment were to change. So if you switched it around and said, like, like if pollinators were more attracted by red flowers than white ones, then the red ones would, would increase. And that's another example of natural selection where pollinators are choosing this. And so, as it turns out, natural selection is the violation of the Hardy-Weinberg that maintains favorable genotypes in a population and results in a favorable change. So I hope you enjoyed our conversation on Hardy-Weinberg's genetic equilibrium.
their theorem that states that populations should remain in genetic equilibrium forever and ever, but indeed they don't, because of drift, selection, gene flow, mutation, and random mating, and non-random mating. And so I hope you enjoyed this conversation on Hardy-Weinberg theorem. Thanks for watching.